Okay, here we go into part seven of uh, debunking the real history www.com site and its racist beliefs uh, that uh, uh, all Caucasians are somehow albino negroids. We got to this picture here last time and I figured that was a great place to stop so we could start with something racist and then go on with good information that he keeps providing. He tries to tell you that this is a black man, that he's a descendant of the original black settlers of the far north. Uh, the Mongol people came later, such as the Siberian Malta and Russian Sungir people around 25,000 years old. So somehow he, he just knows these people were around before 25,000 years ago, even though this is a modern photograph. Now, um, the title of it says, Frontal and Profile Views of a Laplander Anthropological Study by Expedition of Prince Roland Bonaparte. In 1884, printed in circa 1886, the sitter's name was Anders Anderson Anto. Check that name out. And attributions, uh, collection du prince or Bonaparte or whatever it says in Roche. The photographs are housed in the Norse Folk Museum in Norway. And uh, so what they were looking at is these people up in the Arctic Circle that look kind of Eskimoid, and how over here. They look quite a bit different than the Amerindian variant that had gone across the Iberian Bridge. And if you'll look here, he's got facial hair, a woolyish textured hair, uh, and very Caucasian appearance to him. But at this point, he wants to try to call that a black man, even though he's quite pale also. So I think this is his a black person turning into an albino, but he can't quite albino out. And so he's just kind of stuck somehow. This would be his own genetic anomaly, I'm guessing. But strangely, Lapland is up here above the Arctic Circle and its main entirety here in the Arctic Ocean. And it's way above Finland, Norway, and all of that. There's a good gap that's right in between here that they show you that's kind of an indefinite boundary where the people that are up in the Laplands really stay. It's kind of like in North America where we have the Aleutian Alaskans and they really stay up there. Given the opportunity, it seems to be the place they've adapted to and want to stay. We've, we kind of tried to westernize them for a little while and realized that they just want to stay and we're like, oh, we're cool. In fact, we'll cherish that and we'll, we'll prop up your thing, we'll, we'll help you. And so we have, it's, it's been a pretty good thing, I guess, you know, in some views, I guess, but you see where this is. So all of a sudden we was Arctic circles, we would Santa Clauses. Specifics of these ancient East African migrations, which led to modern day colonization of the entire world, can be found here, though, as one would expect when it comes to European Anatolian Turkey settlement, it's not uh, only accurate, inaccurate, it's often racist. Oh no, he's uh, it, just because it doesn't say black people. What would you expect? And so here's the Atlas of Lapland. And so he says, you know, he's just, again, jealous that he can't be part of the white culture, I guess. Um, lost European culture pulled from obscurity before the glory that was Greece and Rome, even before the first cities of Mesopotamia or temples along the Nile. There lived in the lower Danube Valley and the Balkan foothills, a Caucasian people who were ahead of their time in art, technology, and long distance trade. For 1,500 years, starting earlier than 5,000 B.C., they farmed and built sizable towns with few as many as 2,000 dwellings. They mastered large-scale copper smelting, the new technology of the age. Their graves held an impressive array of exquisite headdresses and necklaces. In one cemetery, the earliest major assemblage of, of gold artifacts to be found anywhere in the world. Dr. Anthony is a professor of anthropology at Hartwick College in Ontoa, uh, Onanta, New York, and author of The Horse of the Wheel and the Language, How Bronze Age Riders from the Eurasian Steppes Shaped the Modern World. And again, here are we with the Aryans and the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Doesn't have anything to do with black people, but... Historians suggest that the arrival in southeastern Europe of people from the steppes may have contributed to the collapse of the old European culture about 3500 BC. And then he tries to tack on at the bottom, if you'll look right there, steppe people equals albinos. 
So he wants you to believe that there were black people somehow up there, but they poofy disappeared and they've never found a skull that's got a, a negroid appearance to it. But they keep trying to say, Brana man, see, we was 300s. It's kind of disgusting. They, it's, like, it's like they don't have a correct cognition. And then whenever they hit big words, they just go, oh, black. You know, okay, so Eurasian nomads. The Eurasian nomads were a large group of nomadic peoples of the Eurasian steppe who often appeared in history as invaders of Europe, the Middle East, and China. The genetic title encompasses the ethnic groups inhabiting the steppes of Central Asia, Mongolia, and what is now Russia. They domesticated the horse, and their economy and culture emphasized horse breeding, horse riding, and a pastoral economy in general. So they're pastoralists. They developed the chariot, cavalry, horse archery, introducing innovations such as the bridle, the bit, the stirrup. These are the horse people. Is generalized and somewhat obsolete term from such nomads. So is Aryan. We can't say that anymore which is also sometimes used to describe hunter-gatherer peoples of the North American prairies and South American pampas who started using horses after the Europeans brought them to the Americas. So, the earliest historical phases of China involved conflict with the nomadic Rong and Xingu peoples to the west of the Wai Valley, and we talked about the Xingus. The Roman army hired Sarmatians as elite cavalrymen. Europe was exposed to several waves of invasions by horse people, the Sumerians, like Conan, from the 8th century BC down to the migration period in the Mongols and Seljuks in the High Middle Ages, and the Kamluks and Kirkas and later Kazakhs, Khazars, down into modern times. The earliest example of an invasion by a horse people may have been by the Proto-Indo-Europeans themselves. Following the domestication of the horse in the 4th millennium BC, see Kurgan hypothesis. And I don't think we need to see that. We've, look, we've been looking deeper than they usually talk about into Kurgan hypothesis and uh, Isaac burials and how that relates to Isaac of the Bible and Isaac's sons and how they spread back out, went back west, and then this is your Saxons and so on and how that all relates with a common language too that everybody's realizing now and then yet we're all like uh eh. yeah it's kind of odd but meanwhile while we kind of go wow black people go oh they were black no 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 they weren't the concept of horse people was uh, some importance in the 19th century scholarship in connection with the rediscovery of germanic pagan culture by romanticism see viking revivals which idealized the Goths in particular as a heroic horse people. J.R.R. Tolkien's Rorim may have been seen as an idealized Germanic people influenced by these romantic notions. Similar George R. Martin's nomadic Dothgri people are highly influenced by the lifestyles and culturals, uh, cultures of historical horse peoples. And so we can see this common connection here. And again, I told you about my Tolkien thing that we had, and I'd made that one a long time ago, but I wanted to revise it with better video and, uh, and things. And uh, how that, the Rorium of uh, the, uh, the Tolkien's novels there shows you that connection and how he had talked about Middle Earth. And whenever you find out that Mediterranean means Middle Earth, Terrain is earth, not water. Mediterranean means Middle Earth. Then you kind of see the connection that goes on here. Reference, the above article, there is nothing romantic about ignorant, illiterate, bloodthirsty, barbaric albinos destroying black civilizations and then later having the unmitigated gall to claim them as their own. Problem is, is that none of the skulls, none of anything we find is black, and this is just a back man rambling out of jealousy. Now we get to something important I wanted to talk about. Dobruja. Dobruja. This word carries around bruja from these ancient people that had the pointy hats and all of that. It carries all the way down through to a modern time where in Latin languages, and especially even still found more in South America, you'll find references to bruja. And a bruja is a witch. She is a shaman that knows special magic things and they seek them out to help out whenever children are sick and all these type of things. 
there are bad things with brujas and good things with bruja, but do bruja is the witch that lives near the river in a dwelling. Do bruja. Do bruja is a historical region shared by Bulgaria and Romania, though. So it's on the edge of that whole vampire weird thing that we always had all these weird things about that people had made up and then turned into things like Dracula and all these things, okay? So, located between the Danube River and the Black Sea, including the Danube Delta, Romanian coast and the northernmost part of the Bulgarian coast, the Hamangia was a Middle Neolithic culture in Dobruja, on the right bank of the Danube, in Mutinia, Romania, and is the site of Baia Hamangia. Hamangia culture is connected with the Neolithic of the Danube River, the Delta, and Dobruja. It includes the Vinca culture, Dudeste and Caranovo three culture elements. Uh, and it showed you a blending of those two of Caranovo three with those people. Uh, Kiranadova is the name of the necropolis where the famous statues, the thinker, and the sitting woman were discovered at the Epinonia site of Bayahamanga in Russia. It is discovered in 1953 along Lake Golovita, close to the Black Sea coast in the Romanian province of Dobruja. And here we see that lady who is very healthy again, showing you that appearance, her hand casually upon her knees. And this is the first depiction of the thinking man, the thinker, right? And you can see that he is, oh, I don't know, maybe he's just sweating it out. Maybe she's about to have her baby and he's just wondering and, oh, there's a lot of things you can come up with and the thoughts that go on here. But one thing for sure, this guy's thinking. So that's about 5500 B.C. Now, uh, Hasatoi and the Hambinga culture are cut into three phases. The culture begins in the middle of the 6th millennium BC or 6,000 BC with painted vessels of complex geometrical patterns based on spiritual motifs. These shapes include pots and wide bowls. And in here we do see some of these pictures of women who aren't fat at all, but they show you the triangle here and this is a woman. She doesn't even have big boobs or anything. And this strange head it has been peeled out a thumb over here a thumb over here and to make a face shape and this was originally to put little holes in and to run strings around and you would hang this on as a charm here's a clay figurine in the form of a jar that they've made incised and traced with paint it has traces of paint still left on it they found up in Bucharest and so you can see this is still also a, a, a Venus like figurine but she's all painted and tattooed up these pale people that started doing tattoos. Neolithic fertility goddess Dobrega from Romania, and she's got a large stretch neck. In my other videos, it shows you this tip up here is maybe even a bird's head. And or just earlier when we were talking about how they had a lot of these women and a lot of birds, birds were symbolically used to clean the carcasses of animals. They would put them up on these deuses, much like in Conan, Instead of setting them on fire and cremating them at the time, they would let the birds pick them away and then they would bury them and do things like that or burn them from then on and then take their heads and put it under the dwellings that they had. It goes all the way through to Canaanite type things and stuff and you can see variations on a theme of cultural differences that come out of a commonality. Figurines, pottery figurines are normally extremely stylized and show standing naked faceless women with emphasized breasts and buttocks, two figurines shown as the thinker and the sitting woman are considered masterpieces of Neolithic art. Settlements consist of rectangular houses with one or two rooms built of wattle and daub, sometimes with stone foundations. They are normally arranged in a rectangular grid and form small tents, or small tells. And so these are like little small rising hills that everybody was around. Settlements are located along the coast, along the coastal lakes, and in the lower and middle river terraces and sometimes in caves. Inhumanization. People are in crouched or extended positions in cemeteries. Grave gifts tend to be without pottery. Grave gifts include flint, work shells, bone tools, and shell ornaments. Uh, cultures developed into succeeding the Gumelnitsa, Boyan Varna cultures of the early Eneolithic, Aleucaleolithic, copper and stone, or copper ages without a noticeable break. It just smoothly blends into it. 
<coughs> at the end of the 5th millennium BC, under the influence of some of the Aegean Sea, Mediterranean Sea tribes and cultures, the Gumelinta culture appeared in the region. In the Enolithic, Calolithic, Copper, and Stone Age, white populations migrating from North Asia of the Kurgan culture, see definition below, mixed with the previous population creating the Karadanova culture under Kurgan to influence. So this is Caucasians and Caucasians getting back together after a slight variation over time. The region had commercial context with the Mediterranean world since the 14th century BC as a Mycenaean sword covered at Magneta proves so they had had contact between each other too. In the 6th century BC the first Scythian groups began to enter the region. Dun dun dun! Two Gete tribes, the Crobazi and the Terizi, in 514 BC, King Darius, one of Persia, who said he was an Aryan, written on the walls for all time, subdued the Gete living in the region during his expedition against the Scythians living north of the Danube. At about 430 BC, all the way there, all the way from Persia to there. When they show you this, they show you a blockade and it stops at above or, uh, at Anatolia and they do not speak of this. You'll find it in all these papers that have about pottery and all these things, but as far as a paper about history, they'll stop it there. Do the same thing for Ramses and, and Sinjusret's campaigns and so on too, which I've shown you differences in again. Um, in 341, let's see, uh, in the 4th century BC, the Scythians brought Drobruja under their sway, and in 341 BC, one of their kings, Atheus, fought against Histria, which was supported by Histrianorium Rex, probably a local Gete ruler. See this history words built there, by the way? Just want to note that later. Just want to start mentioning these in another video and these people and how important they are to history. You might get an idea who Hister, Histria, Histrinorium Rex, and stuff have to do with, and these Getic people. In 339 BC, King Atheus was defeated by the Macedonians under King Philip II, who afterwards extended his rule over through the Do uh, Dobruja. In 331 BC, and again in 310 BC, the Greek colonies, led by Calatus, revolted against Macedonian rule. The revolts were suppressed by Lysimachus and the Diadochus of Thracia. And we talked about Thracians. Who also began a military expedition against Dromocates, the ruler of Gete, north of the Danube in 300 BC. In the 3rd century BC, colonies on the Dobru Dobruhan coast paid tribute to the Basili Zalmodarkiros and the Moscon, Moscon, which have to do with Moscow, but and probably ruled also northern Dobruja. In the same century, Celts settled in the north of the region. In 260 BC, Byzantium lost their war with Calatus and Histria for the control of Tomas. At the end of the third century BC and at the beginning of the second century BC. The Bastarne Remaxos, who became the protector of the Greek colonies. Around 100 BC, King Mithridates the uh, sixth of Pontus in Anatolia area, or what we call um, Eastern Asia, extended his authorities over the Greek cities of Dobruja. Mithridates is reported to have been of mixed rake mixed race of Greek and Persian origin and strange he tries to throw that in there because Persians are Aryans and the Greeks are well known to be and so cousins so mixed race of cousins this is as odd and as different and as mixed as it would be if somebody from oh I don't know France was to get with somebody from oh I don't know England they're so different. Anyhow, uh, for he claimed descent from Alexander the Great and King Darius of Persia. And how could he claim both of those? Well, the important thing is how could you claim both of those is if you go back about six generations from these two people, they have a commonality.
And in fact, the whole area does. You look in Herodotus' works and he tells you about how all the people of the whole area were called Arians until certain people got in place and they changed their name due to the name of that person that became the ruler, i.e. Medes, whenever he came from Athens to uh, take over the Medianites, Persis in Persia, and so on. Egypt is not the name of the people that live there. That was given to them by the Greeks. They called their fertile lands Kemet, but that river that we call the Nile today, which was Nilus in Greek, was called the R, A R R. Yeah, and so if you have a culture of people that are Scythia, you call them Scythians. And if there's a people that are around a river R, you call them Proto-Indo-European types. But oh no. Egypt had to have been Negroids too, which of course the West African Negroes have no connection whatsoever to any of the, the people that are out of that area. And of course, look at these pictures he showed you. Jesus was white and all the, uh, Jesus was black and all these things. I just clicked out of this, so now we're going to have to go all the way back down to it. And just a note to you, I'm only about halfway through this. Am I even? Oh yeah, I'm past that. We remember all this. Hmm. Yeah. I can't remember what I've shown you versus what we talked about. But we should be on here showing you these people, Komai people, way up in, in Russia and stuff. And look, they've got red hair and blondes and stuff all mixed into them. If you took that style of dress off these people and put them in modern dress in America, short of them talking and having an accent, what would you think? Well, I can tell you that this one looks Asianish mongoloid, and this one looks a little, but nobody else does. Look at this look here. Yeah. Huh. So this is where he starts going into redheads, and I think I have gone past. I'm, I apologize. Let me go back up here. Oh, yeah, there's the cultist thing. Okay, I was wrong from what I saw to what he had said. So now, yeah, now we're almost back. Here we go. So we were looking at that, and then the Vinca culture is what comes basically next. Um, let's go into that. Vinca, which has Tartaria tablets. So this leads into that Tartarian idea that we were talking about before and just brushing upon. I've got a video ready to, ready to come out, but it's just got a, a little something something into it. It's just almost throw, throwing you a little chip, you know. But uh, Vinca culture was an early culture between the 6th and 3rd millennium BC, stretching around the course of the Danube, what's today Serbia, Hungary, and Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Republic of Macedonia. Although traces of it can be found all the way into the Balkans, as well as parts of Central Europe and Asia Minor, Anatolia, as we were talking about before. Um, so the East Asia, and then you have that little lobe that's over there. They actually call it Asia Minor, and then Asia Major is the bigger part that's over there. And so Asia isn't really what we thought it was, definitely, is it? Because you don't call people that are living in, oh, I don't know, Iran, Asians, do you? No. So that's another thing that twists and it screws everybody up on these type of thoughts. And here's a terrible picture he got. Surely he could have got something better of this Vinca culture. And here they show that this, they have that smeared out head and that pinched look still onto them. And almost a bird head. It has that little, that effect like that onto it and then there's stripes of black across their body and I did plan at this point on showing you uh, the Conan the Barbarian scene where uh, he's come back to have revenge on the Viking looking bastards and uh, he's striped up in black and white across his body and his face and that that again is another recantation of these old people and this idea and something they did for a wartime and such but uh, the older Stereosavo settlement, located in the deepest layers of Vinca sites, I have mud huts and tent roofs were covered with the settles of, uh, settlers of the Stereosavo culture lived in and were also buried. During the period of the Vinca culture, 
Houses were erected above ground with complex architectural layouts and several rooms built of wood that were covered in mud. The houses of the settlement are facing northeast and southwest with streets between them. The other settlements included Devoston, Portajani, Selvak, Polsnik, and Predonica, Lyobikova, and Ujvar. And again, if they would come up with better names for this, but these are like little local names a lot of times for little places and stuff and little forests and areas they find things in, and they attach that always to the people, whether regardless of what they may have been called at that time. If we were to give them more correct names, it would make all of this so much easier. I think I said that uh, first test in school. <laughs> so... Recent excavations at the site of the Polsnik settlement have shed considerable light on the Vinca culture. The Polsnik settlements flourished from around 5500 BC until it was destroyed by a fire in 4700 BC, which apparently ran rampant through the entire place. These findings suggest an advanced division of labor and central organization that they already had going. Vinca houses had stoves inside of them and special holes specifically for rubbish to go out. The dead were buried in cemeteries. People slept on wooden and fur mats and made clothes of wool, flax, and leather. The figurines were not only represent deities, but of many show the daily life of the inhabitants. Women are depicted in short tops and skirts and bearing jewelry. It almost looked like they were in bikinis. The thermal well found uh, where near settlement might have evidence of Eurus' oldest spa. <clears throat> the preliminary dating of Polsnik metal workshop with furnaces and copper tools date to 5500 BC, and if this is correct, that indicates that the Copper Age could have started in Europe 500 years or more before, earlier than previously thought. The sophisticated furnace and smelter features earthen pipe-like air vents with hundreds of tiny holes in them and a chimney to ensure air goes into the furnace and feeds the fire so it is able to you know build up and then they're able to to choke it off in certain ways and unchoke it in certain ways and putting pegs in these holes and it allows you to regulate it even it's kind of amazing but it's a, a it's a sophisticated uh, furnace and smelter features you know these pipes and stuff and copper workshops found elsewhere and from later periods once thought to indicate the beginnings of copper ages were less advanced than that and didn't have chimneys and workers there had to blow air on the fire with bellows whenever this one was actually made to run off the wind in some way and they could control it the Vinkel people left little signs of their languages which may be isolated from any languages existing today but yet we don't think so, since they're all Proto-Indo-Europeans. They had a variant of that name. And here you see a Proto-Lineage tablets of some of the very first writing in the world, and it's really just an ideogram type thing. But you can see how they're using cuneiform style writings and the symbolism of grains as being the texture of writing, even a counting system that looks like one, two, three, four, five, put a line through it, things like that. Deuses bows and arrows things along that line so and it, it it they don't know at this point if it's phonetic or not but it seems like it would be and it would have something to do with that but the vinca symbols are signed also known as the vinca alphabet or vinca tertis script today or old european script are a set of symbols found on prehistoric prehistoric artifacts from the southeastern of europe a few scholars believe they constitute a writing system of that Vinca culture. In, in 1875, archaeology excavations led by the archaeologist Zasofra Torma in 1840-1899 at Tordos, today Tordos, Romania, unearthed a cache of objects inscribed with previously unknown symbols. In 1908, a similar cache was found during excavations to contact in Mole Vasash and in Vinca, a suburb of Belgrade, Serbia, some 120 kilometers uh, from Tordos and another whole settlement. Later, much fragments were found in Banyika and another part of Belgrade. Since then, over 150 Vinca sites have been identified in Serbia alone, but many include Vinca itself and have not been fully excavated. Thus, the culture of the whole area is called the Vinca culture, and the script is often called the Vinca Tordos script. The discovery of the Tartarian tablets in Romania by Nikolai Vasa in 
1961 reignited the debate. Flossa de, uh, believed these inscriptions to be pictograms, and the finds were sub subsequently carbon dated. Man, I need some coffee. To before 4000 BC, 1300 years earlier than the date he expected, and even earlier than the writing systems of the Sumerians and Minoans. To date, more than a thousand fragments of similar inscriptions have been found on various archaeological sites throughout the southeastern of Europe, notably in Greece, Dispelo tablets, Bulgaria, formerly Yugoslavia, Romania, eastern Hungary, Moldova, and southern Ukraine. And I'm telling you that this is what kind of kicked it off again on everything is people getting together and using these tablets to, to have trade back and forth with each other and these mean things and then symbols that go with it and people realize those symbols they made up their own and here we go but when they made up their own you can see the continuity of them through all of them and these winged creatures and anthropomorphic things that led people into a deal of uh, angels and all kinds of thoughts but um, so Chinese scholars have suggested that such signs were produced by convergent developments of what might be called a precursor to writing which evolved independently in a number of societies. Indeed, there are some similarities between Sumerian cuneiform script and stone markings from Cattle Hoyuk in Turkey and Kamyana Mohila in southern Ukraine, both predating the Vika culture by several millennia. And there is a site in Kamyana Mohila that has an early scratch writing that they have deciphered because it's simplistic and it talks about Inanna and Utu and the Sumerian gods and that there is lambs and animals and so on and they found this out and they dated the site to 22,000 BC and then they kept digging farther and more and there's a mammoth on the wall and instantly they said oh that's not a mammoth that has to be a cow and they tried to say it was a cow I've got a video about it if you just look up Kamyana Mohila K-A-M-Y-A-N-A-M-O-H-Y-L-A or H-I-L-A. Either way, it pulls it up. And uh, it's in the southern Ukraine. It's got a, you know, a, uh, a stone circle set that's also based on uh, the crops and everything. And it's got a fertility thing along with it and a lot of other things, too. And it's something that they're leaving somewhat natural the way they found it rather than trying to clean it all up and do something and reset it in any way. They want to leave it alone. Uh, you know, until a time comes where they need to do something or find something else out more rather than just go crazy. These people are likely haplogroup group I, which are Celts and Gauls, who may have also formed the Kutinian Triplian culture that were conquered and Kurganized. See uh, the definition below by horse riding Indo Europeans or white nomadic tribes. And who were they? Well, they were white tribes too. The Kukini Triplian culture. That culture is known uh, as Kukitani uh, culture in Romanian, Triptilian culture from the Ukrainian, and the Tripoli culture from Russian. But it's a late Neolithic archaeological culture that first between 5,500 BC and 2750 BC, the Dynaster Dnieper region uh, around modern day Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine. The Triptians built a large towns in Europe each of them from 10 to 15,000 people. The culture was initially named after Kukitini, Isazi, country in Romania, where the first objects were associated from the culture were discovered. Later they found it blends way out of that range and it probably should be renamed again. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a Triptilia culture hut at the Triptilia Museum and it shows you how they had a house that looks very much like today and, and uh, Joyce holding it up and things and the size of the houses and what they would have been. And uh, here's a more inner look, or interior of a house, where you have separating walls and things, but yet this is, a, again, a squared-off structure, a perfectly square structure. No, they're not all lined up to the sun and the moon, and this is not a burial thing, this is a structure. And they also got up on the second floors and did things, as per what you see, this ladder that they had built there that they found remnants of also. An ancient ware, an ancient black-topped ware, that you can find all the way up through your, uh, in Europe and you also find that same type leading up into Egypt and stuff and some of these urns are huge this blacktop urn here it only shows half of it but this thing is huge it's like three foot tall and so these are like grain holding spots and things like that and here's a reproduction of maybe what a city would have looked like with them it's done in a little diorama like you would on a little train track or something like that but it shows you an idea of it and I swear you look at that and the difference between that 
and the culture of, oh, maybe 1500s in rural towns really doesn't look any different. So we're getting up on the 35. I think I'm going to go to about 40 on this one if we can. No, nah, I second guess myself, people. We're about to get into this uh, other culture here and triptolite statues, which we've just started into. Um, it leads from there into other cultures and some of this odd pottery and things, and it continues to go on from there. It looks like this series may go 10 or 12 on me just going through this all. I think it's odd that he would have so much good information on this site. And, of course, all he does is actually show real history and then just keep trying to tell you they were black. And uh, that's not really true. It's almost like if you could just edit that out of what he's got going on here every once in a while, he keeps throwing in, this would be a good, uh, a good accumulation of some of the Proto-Indo-European logistics and how things did come about. It's the reason I really wanted to show this rather than just do a silly debunk. And I know it took me six or seven videos to really get deep into it here, but uh, yeah. So uh, here we go on this one, and then we'll go to, uh, God, are we all the way to eight? Yeah, okay. Peace.